This is Terry with Hometown News. I'm here today with Coach Fry, one of the greatest Olympic coach in the world. Coach, how did it feel for you to get the uh, honor a couple of days ago? Oh, wow. Becoming a Hall of Famer at East Carolina University, not something that I could have dreamed of. It was something bestowed upon me from heaven uh, because uh, hard work and, and believe, having faith and helping people it's something that I just do natural, and uh, God blessed me to do that with Louise and Buster Fry being my mom and dad from down in Bass, North Carolina, and other people recognize that you do good things for other people, you get recognition for it. Okay, Coach, now I know you're going to be getting recognized tonight, so are you excited about it? You know, uh, I took this uh, opportunity before I was recognized as a Hall of Fame. I didn't know what order they would come in, so I... I accepted being the keynote speaker for the Alumni Association for East Carolina University, Black Alumni, and uh, they're asking me to speak on uh, uh, overcoming hurdles. And uh, well, since I coach track and field, that's kind of uh, right on time. And tr and hurdles is something that I do. But in my life, there's been some struggles, but those struggles have been ones that have led me to a higher height. So uh, I look forward to presenting tonight to an alumni of a fine university like uh, East Carolina University. Okay. Coach, now, you know, everywhere you go, somebody always have a good saying in life. So what is your motto or your good saying? If it's to be, it's up to me. Who can, I can, what's to do, let's do it. I think I've heard that several times before, haven't I? <laughs> I think you've heard that quite. We try to instill that on young people as we do our camp for the Fry Foundation down in Moore County. We try to reach kids in Moore County, Lee County, and uh, Hope County, and Cumberland County. And we're trying to get them to get a personal self-esteem that tells them that their destiny is determined by them. If it's to be, it's up to me. That you take control of things that you can control. You have an opportunity. You got to take advantage of the opportunity. And you never know when, when the world throws you lemons, but you got to make lemonades. You can't let somebody else make the lemonade. You got to make the lemonade. So we try to keep young people inspired. It's the same motto I've had over uh, the 40 years of our life. And my mother instilled in us, get up, clean up, and do something. Well, Coach, i tell you one thing. I know that some people make some lemonade, but I think you got the best recipe. Cause you have you have several, several big winners. <laughs> hey, congratulations and we wish you the best. Thank you. Looking forward to the night. All right, thank you. Since somebody announced you and they say class of 76, I know what some of you think. It's okay, I am old. <laughs> Before I introduce the speaker, uh, I'll just say a little tidbit that you may not know. The speaker of the hour, today is his birthday, his wife's birthday, their anniversary, and I think twins, they got twins and it's their birth birthday today also. That's amazing, isn't it? Speaker of the hour is Curtis Alfonso Fry, 1970 through 1974. Credits his time at East Carolina for molding his organization, organizational and leadership skills. As a student, he joined the student government and was a member of the Young Democrats. It is ECU, he states, that prepared him to work with people of all genders, all races, and all sizes. Curtis, who was lured to East Carolina by Hall of Fame inductee Bill Carson, Bill Carson was the track coach for many, many years. After graduating, he became the first African-American coach for an intercollegiate sport in the school history in 1974, when he was hired to oversee the men's soccer program. He served as an assistant track coach simultaneously for five years, from 1974 through 79, helping the Pirates capture three Southern Conference championships. 
He has spent the past 22 seasons as a head coach at the University of South Carolina and has mentored over 60 NCAA champions, 119 SEC titleists, 17 academic All-American student athletes, and more than 480 NCAA All-American selections. He is a member of the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association Hall of Fame. Curtis states that his priorities, that his priorities are faith, family, and community. Values instilled in him while growing up in a small town of Voss, North Carolina. He says East Carolina represents who he is, and we're proud of his induction just last weekend into the ECU Athletic Hall of Fame. Please help me welcome our evening speaker, Coach Curtis Fry. And my friend, and he's old too. blessing and an opportunity that I've uh, been wanting to come do a long time, thanks to uh, uh, one of my friends down here uh, asked me a long time ago. And I couldn't, I couldn't get it done, but I'm thanking uh, Ms. McCray for continually uh, staying on me about being a contributor and being involved in, in this organization. Uh, I never understood the magnitude of the organization. Uh, just listening tonight at the table, uh, the contributions that you're making from this, as my wife bumps me and says, what kind of check we're going to write? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very often she doesn't do that. She's an East Carolina alumnus also. And uh, as they were mentioning how many years we've been together, well, uh, East Key U kept us together. <laughs> She came down um, here to go to school, and we got married, and Harvey uh, was in my wedding. And, uh, so there's so many things about ECU. In fact, half of the track team was in my wedding. The guy in the track team gave me $100 such that I could uh, get the, the license uh, to get married. A guy named Carter Suggs from, from Tarboro, North Carolina. I learned how to be first from my mom. She integrated public schools in uh, North Carolina in 1964, but it was after East Carolina had already integrated a university uh, in, in 1962, I'm sorry. And, and East Carolina had already integrated before we did public schools. Uh, it was a frightening experience for me to go to a, a school whenever you're in the seventh grade lead a predominantly black school, Pickney High School, and, and go over and, and have people burn crosses in your yards and, and throw. So we're, we're talking about on the way, my, and my title is, he said gold medal, and I'm going to talk about going over hurdles. Uh, hurdle coaching is what I do. It's what's taking me to a, a very high level because the first person that I, that I coached in the Olympic Games uh, was a hurdler. The first gold medalist that I had was a hurdler. He was Alan Johnson. The first craft I learned from Bill Carson here was about hurdling. And then he sent me to clinics to Dr. Leroy Walker because he didn't want to go to work with Dr. Leroy Walker because they were rivals at North Carolina Central. I got blamed for recruiting by the black schools in, in the state of North Carolina. I was a Tom, because I got African Americans to come to East Carolina to do sports. Uh, I helped Pat Dye recruit some of the best. Eddie Hicks came because Curtis Fry went in his house, and and Ruffin McNeil came. I was the only one here. The, and it, Oliver Mack, 
I recruited Willie Bryant, a Hall of Famer, who was on the wrestling team. Yep, I was the guy that went in the house. I didn't know, I was 22 years old. Uh, I was here, Leo Jenkins hired me. He hired me because he wanted an African-American coach to be a head coach, because he was gonna run for governor. And I had worked to help the governor in a few years, the young Democrats out of Moore County. I was a black young Democrat. I met a guy by the, by the name of Kenny that was from down here, Kenny Hammond. And Kenny Hammond and I were on a committee in, uh, in North Carolina student legislature in North Carolina. And he said, come to college with me. And I came to college at East Carolina, not because I was coming to play football, uh, because I was involved in politics. Uh, my goals, uh, my mom uh, took me to NAACP while I was coming out of little schools and, and motivation and watching, and watching crosses burnt in my yard. And, but my mama would make me get back on the bus in public school. And then by the time I got to this place, I had to be a leader. I had to go forward because mama had invested in me. She taught me how to stand out by the corner down there by Belt Dorm while, there were, while the kids were marching from over at Rose High School and how to calm that down so that it wouldn't turn to where it was going to be policemen versus kids and, and be involved in that organization and then get involved with an organization here called Souls. Um, I don't know if they still have it. And then to formulate my own group called Evo, Independent Black Organization. I was always sticking my nose in places. It probably hindered my development as far as being hired at a high level early because I was considered around the country one of the best recruiters in the country, one of the best coaches. So it took me 22 years to get to be a head coach because they said that I might be a little bit uh, controversial. I was too too aggressive. I was too opinion, opinionated. I was somebody that should, you know, he's good enough to be an assistant. I helped the University of Florida win four championships on the Triple Crown. At NC State, we won six ACC championships, and NC State had never had a team that finished in the top five in the NC2A. I coached a team to the four one national championship at NC State. A job came open at UNC Wilmington. I said, surely if I can coach there at NC State, I can be the head coach at Wilmington. Uh, the financial director that raised funds that had me go out to help raise funds at NC State became the athletic director, but he didn't hire me. Appalachian State came open. Surely now, I can, I can get up to Boone. Uh, I've done a good job down in East Carolina. I've recruited, I've helped Pat Dye win 70 home football games by helping him get the best talent and forcing the University of North Carolina to sign more African American because the first players that were dominating because we, we were dominating the state of North Carolina in football, the NC State too, but they didn't have a lot of players, but East Carolina did. So surely now I can help recruit I can help recruit a basketball team. I can help team win four, as you say, three. No, we won four championships while I was here at East Carolina. Another thing, I didn't know anything about soccer. Yeah, they hired me. Leo Jenkins said, okay, we gotta get us a black. A guy who came in my office that raced, oh yeah, that was it. I, I, I'm a real dude. I have a radio show called Keeping It Real. But let me tell you, Leo Jenkins saw me more than he saw most students. If he didn't have a cheerleader, which we did get an African-American cheerleader, cause, because, just because one reason, my mama told me, if the black guys can play, then the girls can cheer. <laughs> so if he wants you to help him run for something, then you ask for something. So I asked. So next thing you know, we got us two, I don't even remember their names. But we got two cheerleaders. Because Carlesto was going in the end zone. He was definitely taking the ball to the house. Ruffin was knocking him down, and Pickney was catching him and intercepting him. Why come we can't have no cheerleader? So we got a cheerleader. And a cheerleader. It was a war. 
Debbie was, Debbie was shooting. I don't know if y'all remember Debbie Freeman. She was putting it up before they put it up now. Some people have selected memories records. I had a president the other day here, and he was saying about how good we've gotten in education in, at East Carolina. I had to let him know, no, East Carolina was the number one in 1974 in graduating teachers, surpassed Appalachian State and Chapel Hill. And then we decided to open us a med school. Our med school has grown to the point where it's got as big a med enrollment as any school in the state of North Carolina. We didn't start being first. East Carolina been first a long time. I, I, I know that we got a, a, a military man back there. I didn't know we had a lieutenant colonel that is over there in the corner. I mean, we, we represent our country. ECU, that's right over here. Y'all make sure that, that we... <laughs> Hurdles and struggles, Curtis Fry been through a few. And never regretted, not one. Uh, one, uh, a story I like telling them, is that guy that brought me down here was Bill Carson. He had a crew cut hair and uh, he, he, he had, yeah, the son did burn his neck. And if you looked at him, that's what they used to say. And then he had, he didn't like people with afros and he didn't like people that didn't wear sandals. So, but he was a Christian. So he had to learn to love me. So he took me to a church in Blackjack in 1972. The first time, everybody fed me. They enjoyed having me out there to eat. And the next week or two, he took four more of us. And we did Sunday school. But the fourth week, they asked him for his membership. So he picked up and moved. He told either we had to come, his track team had to come, or he wasn't going to come. So I learned to love that guy. So then I had to stop being that guy that thought that all white persons were just trying to get over and get by and use black athletes to be successful. I learned this guy, as I wasn't very fast. It's a guy that stood up with his faith versus people he'd been with for 10 or 15 years. And he stood up and he changed his membership for us to be able to go to school to church. I said, you know what? I got to stop that side of me. I had to learn to love. And then I learned to love early, but I had to recognize some things. There was people out of my neighborhood that needed loving. That helped me was preparing to become an Olympic coach. Because in the sport that I'm in, you got people of all colors from all parts of the world and all nations. You got them from all genders. You got them from different genders. Track and field is a sport in which you have, you have persons that are from Africa, Asia, every nation in the world I coach. There's 52 nations in which I've had national champions from, our own national championship team are involved. You know, there was a mistake they made on my announcing who I am. They said we had 17 uh, academic All-Americans. No, that's 117. Somebody misprinted that. I, I take offense because you know what, that leads a whole lot of countries, a whole lot of teams. Uh, I don't know if that's an accident or an intention. Because the assumption is that people who run sometimes because you're a predominantly sprint school that you don't have all academic All-Americans. Let me tell you a little, little story. And I, it's constantly my stories. I've run past what I got written because you know what, staying with what I write gets me off of where I am and who I am. When I, uh, they gave me, you know, it was difficult for South Carolina to hire me. A guy called me. My wife and I were living beside a guy that owned 30 Waffle Houses. Oh, boy. But we took care of his kid. One of his kids was struggling. And so we were, you know, I was, my son talk about money. We won't make him very much. I was working at Chapel Hill. As a system coach. But that didn't stop us from loving his kid. 
His kids are struggling. He's about 18 years old. And then one day the guy saw that I give my kids their key to get in the house. They were only um, eight, nine, ten years old, something in there. And um, my wife got home. It was my night to pick them up from elementary school. Uh, she came home, and I came home. So about seven, that was about seven o'clock. It's dark. We both have forgot the kids. <laughs> Nowadays you go to jail for doing that. <laughs> I drove back, we drove back over to Durham and we and uh, I hustled over there and I got the kids. Well from then on the guy started, my kids got off, started, we let them come home on the bus then. And they get home and they lost the key. So the guy moved them into his, he would pick my kids up and let them into his house. And he'd keep my kids. Now one night he came and he knocked on my door. Went, bah, 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 bah. Oh God. I, I, I'd like to talk to him on the porch. Normally. But he won't come in. He had something to tell me. He said, I got a job for you. I want you to be, I got a job. I said, oh Lord, I got a job. I mean, University of North Carolina assistant coach. See, I've been a lot, East Carolina took me a lot of places. First it was East Carolina. And then I went from there to Fayetteville to coach in high school. And from Fayetteville in high school, I went to NC State. And from NC State, I went to the University of Florida. From the University of Florida, I went to the University of North Carolina. But I still had done a lot of interviews, and it was always the same thing. Came up number two. So this guy said he got a job for me. I said, oh, I don't want to do this. I've, I've resolved myself that we we're running and winning ACCs. We've run 13 championships in ACC as a system. I don't want to do this no more. I'm gonna just I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and graduate smart kids, and I'm gonna be the head. I'm gonna go over to Duke, cause Duke gives free degrees, and I know my kids are gonna be smart enough to get into Duke, and so I'm gonna make this little thirty plus thousand dollars, and I'm gonna be the assistant coach at Duke with three kids with Duke degrees. I've, I've got my plan. I don't need interference. In this hurdle right now that came up, this is an interference. Leave me alone. I didn't say it, but he said, look, I give $20,000 a year to the, uh, they call it Gamecock Club. I'm a big Gamecock. Now, I can make a phone call. I'm like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I, my heart been broke. I done been to Appalachian State. I done been over to a and I done been everywhere, and everybody comes up, but you're really good recruiter. But, you know, a, we're going to call you tomorrow. Even in high school, at Union Pines High School, I had come from high school coaching where we won the state of Eastern North Carolina State Championship as an assistant. We, we spent seven kids to the NFL from Douglas Bird High School. 4A school. They asked me to interview at my school where I'm in the Hall of Fame at this time. I went to the interview. While sitting there in the interview, they said, we're going to call you back. I got home. I got a phone call. It asked me to come to be the assistant coach for a guy who hadn't played at NC State so that you can build this program back to a championship level. I'm going to be number two in my own hometown. I don't need somebody calling me and knocking on my door and asked me to go for November. I, I don't, I, I'm doing good. I got three kids, my wife is doing good. I got a plan to go to Duke and get them through. <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> he was persistent, he says, you've looked after me, you've looked after my kids, you've looked after my wife, y'all are good family, you got great morals. Oh God, he's pepping me up. <laughs> so I get a phone call, because most of the time when people tell you they can do things, uh, they can't deliver. They, you know, I didn't have my neck out here a few times. Hey, some of my own people put my neck over there. Oh, don't worry, we got you. We're gonna cover you. You step out. I kind of get like, mm, my mama about the only one who got me. I mean, really, she could call Roy Wilkins when they burn a cross. She, my mama could step out. She'd come walking down the hall with her feet turned sideways and everybody knows the lawyer gonna come when Louise come 
with her feet coming down the hallway. Miss Louise, don't call that N double A, you know, A A E C P. <laughs> she make things happen. That's one I knew can make things happen. I believe that I need to get in the huddle. That's my whole deal. Get in the huddle so I know the play. Get on the board of trustees. Get myself, formulate my own organization so that when we got some pull, we got some plow, we can say, no, we, I can use the word we, because that's what my mama taught me. It's what I hadn't got there yet. Had to go through the struggles to get lined up so I could get in the huddle. Get in my own huddle. But this dude, he was interfering. So I got a phone call. So, yeah, okay, he got enough pull. $20,000 a year gives him enough pull to get me a phone call. It said, hey, we're looking for a, an SEC, and we need to, we're looking for an African-American, which I didn't like them looking for an African-American. Because I, 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 I done won championships in all white leagues. Why am I not the best op, op, option you have? Why? So I, I, I listened to that, and he said, I'll tell you what, we've been looking around and said we can't find nobody qualified. So, so you're bringing me because... I'm an African American, and you can't find nobody qualified. Whew. Do I run my mouth, or do I listen to this conversation? I listened to it, and he said, well, I have a plane up there on Friday. I'm going like, I'm working at the University of North Carolina. I'm excited about the University of North Carolina. And the AD over there, he's the kind of guy like, if you go for an interview, you better take the job. <laughs> now, wait a minute, I got three kids, a wife, and we paying our bills. We, hey, I'm not too far from mama. I can drive an hour to Vance, North Carolina. My wife's grandparents who raised her, they're an hour away, and my kids like going there on Sunday and eating with granny. Why do I need to go be a head coach? I'm, I'm tired of this. So I said, okay, but I'm tell you how this is gonna be. You call, you come get me, and said, we'll fly, we'll have a plane there in Chapel Hill to pick you up on Friday. I call in. <coughs> uh. <laughs> uh. <coughs> I can't come to work today. <laughs> well, I'm on my plane, and he sent an 80-year-old air pilot. <laughs> this dude might have a heart attack. I've got to ride with this dude down, so I flew down with him. I went in an interview. I knew the guy who interviewed before me. I knew the standards of the SEC. I knew all SEC had five assistant coaches. I knew what the salary range. I did my homework. I knew what the facility demands were. But I knew South Carolina did not have any of those. But the guy ahead of me, he asked, they asked him, what would it take for you to take this job? The guy, he told them five full-time coaches. He told them $80,000 salary. He told them that I've got to have a brand new facility in five years. So, so I got to beat that guy. Well, this is pretty good. They're looking for a black guy, and the guy in front of me asked for what they can't give. All right? Mama told me, good, what do you have to offer? That's all that I He said, what? What do you have to offer? He told me the salary, $56,000. I was making thirty-two. dollars Uh-oh, I hit a lot. <laughs> Next thing, I said, before I leave here, he said, well, we like, we knew you won everywhere you've been. I knew you've been successful. We know you know all the regulations, the rules. You've passed every test. You." Uh, but I said, it'll be a mistake if you hire me. If you don't allow me to have kids in school and if they can't graduate. If you can't give me what it takes, I'll make life miserable. I won't be quiet if I can't win. And I won't be quiet if I can't graduate. Can I get people in the school that, can, that everybody else can get in? And he said, you never have a problem. I went off to the Olympic Games. I didn't announce to anybody. And while I'm at the Olympic Games, the kid that I was coaching, named Alan Johnson, the gold medals, uh, first gold medalist, uh, 
We won the Olympic Games in the hurdles in 1996. I get back to the hotel. Uh, the guy knew where I was staying. His name was Mike McGee from Elizabeth City. He at one point was the head coach here at East Carolina University. Uh, two years before I came here, he went to Duke. But he knew me, he knew the background of what it took to be an Eastern North Carolinian. How it took the struggles that we went through during the period. He grew up, he's much older than me, but he saw the plights and the battles of an East Carolina, uh, Eastern North Carolinian. He called me and he said, you, you ready to be the head coach? And uh, I said, yes. I drove down. My family had come back from Houston. And there was a night that they had that uh, war, uh, they had some kid blew a bomb up in Atlanta. And, and my wife hadn't got to the hotel, but I got the phone call when she come in. She didn't know why I was excited because she was scared I was downtown Atlanta. Why that bomb went off. All kinds of struggles come when you're getting ready to hit that, hit that flight. I don't always get, uh, I've always, I mean, things have been exciting for me. Uh, I've been blessed. Got that job that night and uh, drove them down there to look at it. Found a house. Never lived a night. Not more than two where my whole family didn't move at the same time as I did. That was a struggle for me because he said it's going to be, now we've got to sell that place up in Chapel Hill and got to get my daughter who's a junior in, in high school convinced that she got to come and she got to leave from being the senior class president. Oh, Lord, I got, that's another war now. She, so I, uh, I said, I don't know. I took the job, stayed in a hotel, away from a family that I ain't never stayed more than two nights. We move, when I move, we move. That's the way it go. I think that's the way you make 44 years. Uh, you kiss, you fuss, you kiss before you go to sleep. I mean, you, well, no, no, don't be mad now. She, I gotta tap her when she's crying. That's a part of the struggle, because you can't make it without a team. Had to have a teammate, had one with roots. Not leaves that when the wind blow, they fall off the tree. <laughs> Not branches that break, but one with roots. One with a, with, that came from family, Eastern North Carolina family, seven, seven siblings. A hundred-year-old grandfather. And where they have a hundred people come to their family reunion, uh, no, five hundred. <laughs> where I went to the family reunion when she was 16, I saw roots. So I had my roots. Now, my wife is starting to do stuff like this. That means it's time for me to start getting to. That's why, that's why we, she comes, she gets the camera going, and, and then she starts to do this. Because, see, when you've been 44 years and you've been a coach and you've got a chance to be a, a national champion at a school that never had a national champion, that they don't announce about very often. When I went into the place, I saw a sign. It says, first to the front. I knew how to do that. Because I'd been first in public school. I'd been first to help get a cheerleader. I'd been first, first 13 times at Chapel Hill. First at University of Florida four times. First six times at NC State. First three times at Douglas Bird High School. I, I know how to get this first thing done. So I get our team to first, and then they decide they're going to make me on the Olympic staff. I got 18 athletes on the Olympic team. Got no choice. Somewhere down the line, they got to give me one. But they make me an assist. They says nothing open. You got to take the women. Normally, if you take the women's team assistant, you never get back to be a head coach on the men or even the oh, Did that. Marion Jones, I recruited her to sign her. I left her. Don't, don't feel sorry for me because she is not broke. She's broken because people turn their back on you know, them leaves. They were there to receive part of her $7 million a year being the richest paid woman athlete. They were there for that, but they weren't there when they stumbled. Oprah was 
Robin was. So don't feel sorry, a bright woman. First person to help elect the president. Because her drugs, everybody, nobody else went to jail for doing steroids. There were two baseball players that year that didn't go. But because she didn't know, she said, I'll do the time if I do the crime. That was her mentality. So when they asked her a question, she gave them an answer that she thought was true. She just had bad people around her. So Marion Jones, that's one of my babies that I still acknowledge that I, I brought from California out here. I know I went to get her, and I brought her here. I've had such a blessing. Bolt, oh yeah, when he was 16 years old, after 14 years old, I, I went to Jamaica and taught him drills. God has just blessed me to be in the presence. East Carolina, not me. East Carolina and Louise Fry had taken me to some places and things. <laughs> ECU, don't start the fight. The little girl's picture that was up on the wall up here that they were talking about, oh yeah, she gonna do things that our Bible tells us greater. We'll do greater things, bigger things, don't doubt. Just have the faith and invest. Invest in our children. Not just your own. Our children. You are bigger when you're a giver. Oh, hitting the lottery, that'll be good. I want to pay big taxes. I want to be a pay. I'm really. My whole goal, I tell my wife, is why do we want to pay taxes? I want them big. I, want, I, I ain't going to do like... 45. <laughs> I ain't gonna hide. Y'all gonna know I paid them. I wanna drive big cars, live in big houses, and pay big taxes. I'm ECU. That's why we roll. <laughs> Last and closing, because it's got to be 15 minutes. <laughs> you got to ask yourself this, because there's too many people not successful. There's too many people hungry. There's too many people homeless, homeless, and there's too many people from That I don't take that as that old boy I talk about butthole countries and and stuff like that. It's too many people. Why? Why me? Why did I end up being at ECU? Why? I, those are questions that one of my athletes asked me whenever I had high expectations of her. Why do I have to have this talent? Why did God give? Well, He could have given it to my brother, my cousin, my aunt, each one of you. Why you? That's an that's a awesome responsibility when God has blessed you with a gift and a talent. Why you? The danger in the why you is what are you going to do with what God gave you? Are you going to hover it and bear it and sleep on it? Why you? You have to ask yourself that constantly. Every day when you breathe, why am I still breathing? Why am I walking? Why am I talking? Why do I have children? Why do I have grandchildren? Why do I have smart little three-year-old that jumps on me and says, time for oatmeal, Grandpa? <laughs> Why me? Why me? Why am I still married? Why did that lady put up with me? Why? <laughs> the why in our lives or is the challenge of our life. Why do I have four degrees from East Carolina University? That is incredible why to make a difference. To be sitting at a table with two young people getting ready to kick it to the next level so you can impart. We have to become mentors to end the why me. Don't sit on greatness. I have to stay in coaching. If you see me not in coaching, they fired me. I'm going to pick that check up. <laughs> I've seen the retirement options. I got a 401k. 
I did invest, but it ain't that check. When I go through it, it's half of that check. <laughs> My wife likes shopping. <laughs> she likes traveling. She been to Monaco four times. She liked to go to places that my mama couldn't go. But why me? Why can I do that? I'm going to tell you, don't sit on it. It will go away. Don't retire and quit. Retire so you can invest in somebody else. I'm going to ask you to say something for me. If it's to be, if it's to be, if it's to be, it's up to me to change North Carolina, to change America. If it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, to change the way people look at the African Americans. If it's to be, it's up to me to change East Carolina University. If it's to be, if it's, to be, it's, up, to me. it's up to me. Don't you take your finger and say, who can? 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 I can. I can. Who can? 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 I can. I can. Let's do it.